Yeah, that's that's great. That's great. So um, now we will have our next speaker. So we have uh, Andreas. So uh, I hope I pronounced correctly. <laughs> Andreas, is, is that how I pronounce your name or did I butcher your name? Sorry about that. Andreas. <laughs> Andreas, yes. Okay, so um, yeah, I see that you're going to uh, talk about heartbeat. Uh, so it's it's gonna be uh, something different, right? It's like it's gonna be very interesting. Like you know, uh, Python usually people won't relate that to a human body. So <laughs> I think that would be a very interesting talk. So um, and yes, that's the slides there, and um, I will let you take us away then. Okay. My name is Andreas Lostermann, and today I'm going to present to you a topic that is very close to my heart, and probably yours. I graduated from veterinary school in 2018, so I am a licensed veterinarian in Germany, but I have mostly worked as a full-stack developer. Currently, I am employed um, at a company doing full-stack work with mostly React and .NET. And my talk is going to be about heartbeats and how to detect them. Your heart is the organ that is pumping blood through your body and it does so at a certain rate. And there are quite a few ways to observe what the heart is doing, how well it is doing it, and even to detect potential problems. This talk is going to cover some basics about the physiology different kinds of heartbeat sensors, and especially electrocardiography or ECG. Hey, uh, Andrea, sorry to interrupt, but I think that your slice is not really working uh, for the stream. So maybe we have to uh, do, uh, do you mind resharing again? So maybe hopefully we will fix that. I think it's, uh, I can go. I didn't. Do oh, anything. now. Oh, OK. Now, now it's OK. Sorry about that. I thought it's not working. That's fine. OK. Yeah, and um, yeah, this talk is going to be about uh, different kinds of heart sensors, about physiology, and I'm going to show you how to build a relatively simple Arduino-based ECG device, and then I'm going to introduce you a bit to ECG analysis with a bit of data science and machine learning. So, observing the heart with computers, uh, there are several basic modalities to observe a mammalian heart with a computer. Uh, one would be acoustic uh, as phonocardiography, uh, which is how the smart people uh, call it. And um, this is basically like a stethoscope or you, put, you use a microphone and you're mostly interested in lower frequencies. Um, there are even digital stethoscopes out there right now, um, but they aren't very common uh, because they are probably expensive and uh, if you carry them around a lot, then they break. Um, anyway, then there are mechanical sensors, which is called seismocardiography, and um, that is relatively recent um, because we now have these little MEMS uh, accelerometers that you could also attach to, attach to an Arduino or something, and you can attach the sensor to uh, the clavicle and then measure the waves, the information, or you, you can measure vibrations coming from the heart, and these, this information would be similar a bit to uh, phonocardiography, but even lower frequencies, and it could also be quite useful. Um, optical sensors, uh, many of you have seen those uh, often, they get attached to the finger and they shine a light through the tissue and by reflecting or transmission, or by, by measuring the reflection or transmission of that light, you can tell um, the heartbeat uh, because the blood is pumping through the tissue and then it changes its transmission or reflection or whatever. And there's also a neat trick to tell how oxygenated the blood is. And that's not going to be part of this talk. The electrocardiographic uh, modality is probably the workhorse of uh, cardiology or has been for a long time. 
And um, that is about measuring electrical potential difference, uh, differences, which I'm going to talk more about later. Then there's um, ultrasound, which has somewhat replaced ECG in some applications. And it is a very real time way of looking at a heart and you can tell a lot about valve functioning and so on. Then there lately have been more and more research into using MRI and CT, but that of course is out of the range of any uh, normal hacker. This is from Wikipedia, a video of an ultrasound recording in 4D, 4D because it has this 3D presentation and um, the fourth dimension is time. And you can actually watch in real time how all the moving parts are moving and you can even tell when something is flowing where it shouldn't. And that's why this has been very, um, very much used uh, for everyday cardiology. Um, also, these devices can cost, cost a few hundred thousand dollars right now, um, the most advanced uh, devices, which is more than an entry-level computer tomograph or something. Um, now there's also real-time MRI, uh, which is also relatively recent, and you can give even more information or get even more information because it's magnetic resonance imaging and it looks rather cool. Now I'm going to tell you a bit about how this actually works. So we need to understand that the heart is a pump and the mammalian heart has four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. The atria are small, the smaller ones, and the ventricles are the bigger ones. And the left ventricle is pumping blood through the main body circuit, and the right ventricle is pumping blood through the lung circuit. Veins feed the atria, and coming from the body circuit for the right atrium and the lung circuit for the left atrium, the atrium is a kind of a priming pump. So before the larger ventricles contract, the small ventricles pump the blood into the bigger ventricles and for optimal function, um, these smaller ATA have to um, contract first, followed by a contraction of the ventricles. And several things can go wrong with all of that and uh, all of these problems um, could lead to reduced cardiac output. A little bit about heart cell physiology. How would that all, all of that work on maybe also an electrical level? The heart muscle cells are a very specialized kind of muscle cell. They um, know how to contract or when to contract, mostly because the neighbor cell co contracted, which they sense by an electrical impulse. Each cell forwards its excitation to the next cell. This actually works a lot like a laula wave. Uh, where, like in the stadium where somebody stands up, then the next uh, man stands up and so on. And it's much of the same uh, or the same principle in, a, um, in the heart excitation. You basically, basically have a traveling wave um, of uh, heart cells getting excited. And when they are, um, when they just contracted, they go into a sort of a dormant phase where they can for a few well, milliseconds um, for a certain period, they can't um, get excited again. And when we are doing electrocardiography, we are listening to the waves of electrical potential generated by the excitation of these cells. Now, what is ECG anyway? As I said, um, there's this traveling wave of excitation and we need to, uh, we need to measure the electrical potential difference between two points. Mostly or most standardly that would be the left arm and the right arm. And then we have a reference electrode um, somewhere else. And they are standardized 
ways of doing this, uh, which I'm not going into right now. Um, yeah, to actually measure this, you would need a differential ampl amplifier. And I actually don't understand this diagram. Uh, I'm not an electrical engineer. And uh, anyway, this is um, this would be from Wikipedia and shows how uh, a differential amplifier might work. And uh, components and these uh, components are relatively tricky to set up for um, for a beginner electronics uh, hobbyist and that's then that's a good thing that we have these ADH233 uh, ADH8232 ECG sensor boards uh, this is a small little chip on this breakout board with a lot of small and tiny components in between. Um, the good thing about this board is it just takes one power supply of um, ground and 3.3 volts, and then it gives you an output, an analog voltage signal uh, from zero to 3.3 volts. It also has lead off detection with the LO plus and minus pins which I'm not going to go into, and the SDN pin will um, is, is, is a basic heartbeat detector, uh, which you could also listen to, and then uh, the, uh, the this um, heart-shaped uh, outline surrounds an LED that is also uh, beating to your heart if it works. Uh, the headphone jack is for electrode connection. Um, the, some of these boards come with an electrode cable or three electrode cables that plug into um, a headphone jack and or a headphone uh, um, connector, and then you can connect these relatively simply. But um, people say that this doesn't work that well, and I also prefer to solder electrodes to the um, to the three connections at the uh, top edge here, and they are also label, labeled for right arm, left arm, and um, right foot, I think. Uh, right leg. Now, if you have amplified the signal, now you need to read it. You need to convert the analog signal to something digital, which is the job of analog digital converters. and. Uh, Arduino boards often have an ADC built in, but it also has problems. And these I squared C devices uh, can convert um, analog signals at 16 bit versus 12 bit, and at 860 samples versus 3000 uh, samples. I went with the right one because I wanted to have 1000 samples per second. Another um, secret about these boards, at least the cheaper ones, is that if you feed them 3.3 volts instead of 5 volts, then uh, they are slower, um, and you just need to know that. Uh, if you don't know I squared C, it's basically, and some people will hate this analogy. I, do, I squared C is a bit like USB for microcontrollers. It's a, it's a bus for data connection or data transference. Uh, between the microprocessor and some periphery devices, and it only needs two connections, two uh, pins, which is also quite nice. Uh, then I chose the ESP32 as um, as a controller board for this um, for this project, and I chose one with an LED and a battery. Uh, you can put a lithium ion battery in there, which is good because um, when you deal with high amplifications and signals, then uh, the power line can inject transference even over a USB uh, connection. And this makes it a bit easier. Um, this, these particular devices want to be called VMOS Lolin 32. Um, that's not really documented anywhere, but if you call them anything else, then the IDE won't upload to 
um, through this board, all DSP32 are dual cores with um, have two. They have two uh, CPUs, and they are running at 240 megahertz. That is quite nice because they can. They have quite a bit of power. They can also be programmed with MicroPython or Circuit Python. I decided to use C++ with the Arduino framework because I needed better uh, better scheduling and real-time performance uh, for what I'm doing. Um, and as you know, when C++ is your hammer, everything else starts to look like a thumb. Uh, that was from the PyJobs con uh, collection, by the way. So the general plan is collect samples from I squared C ADC, drive that loop through a timer interrupt, put samples into a buffer. At regular intervals, send the filled buffer off by Wi-Fi. Uh, I'm using TCP IP now, but I could also use uh, UDP, which has advantages and disadvantages. And that would, uh, I, I would like to make a joke about UDP right now, but you probably wouldn't get it. Now, the big, biggest problem here is that uh, sending takes at least four milliseconds. And if you do it naively, then uh, you have a gap of four milliseconds in your one millisecond spaced uh, samples. So what you need to do is multitasking with these two cores on the ESP32. Uh, the ESP32 can run free ARTOS, and that is a real-time operating system. Uh, the correct way to implement it, and I have discovered a few not so correct ways, uh, is to do the sample collection on core one. So there I fill the buffer with the samples I collect. Um, then I then I need uh, another task on core zero, which sends the buffers at regular intervals. Uh, now, what you need to know about TCP IP and Wi-Fi is um, they need a lot of housekeeping and the microprocessor has to spend some attention on that. Uh, so your task must not block core zero at um, as too long or otherwise nothing happens uh, with your Wi-Fi. You have to call VTAS delay and VTAS delay until, and if you've ever worked with SMIO, it's basically the same uh, same principle. Your task um, monopolizes um, its core or thread, and nothing else can happen until you yield. Yeah, um, I'm going to try and uh, switch to my live demonstration now. The problem is it doesn't really work completely. Um, I can I have gotten ECG signals with this um, setup before, but unfortunately the connections are not very reliable, and I might have I might have some uh, ideas how to improve that in the future. But right now it doesn't work. But basically it it sends samples at 1,000 um, frames, 1,000 samples at a second. And um, I have a fast, fast API server running, collecting the samples or receiving them, and then putting them out to this Bokeh React app. I wrote an integration of Bokeh with um, React that works over WebSockets. Uh, here we get some signals, but that's almost, yeah, well, I've gotten signals that actually look like ECG, but this is really not it. So I better stop the presentation or the demo right there. Um, but that's what you get when you try live things. Uh, wrong button. So.
now we are back to the presentation and let's do some data science. I promised data science. You can go to uh, physionet.org and download data. Um, it, most of the records in VFDB format, most of the records are in VFDB, WFDB uh, format. And uh, there are several databases, uh, collections of samples. Sometimes they are labeled with all sorts of things and that's of physiology, part of physiology. Also, um, there are not just ECG recordings, also EMG, EEG, other things. Of course, there's a Python module, module for that. Um, I'm not going to, into, going to go into that much. You can, of course, plot the data. Um, this is ECG data. Most of the time, uh, the recordings are with two leads, um, which means a two-dimensional signal. And um, yeah, that's just about all there is to it. Uh, what you can also do is um, you can plot 2D histograms. I am using data, sh data shader um, here uh, from PyData, and uh, this is just a 2D histogram of um, the two lines or the two leads moving together. And then you get a picture of how the, um, how the heart, how the electrical processes are traveling or how the, um, the traveling wave is uh, moving uh, because basically with two uh, two leads you can intersect the three-dimensional movement of this traveling wave and uh, this shows you how um, how predictable the heart is uh, beating or how predictable um, the electrical connections are and it can look a bit more strange, like these uh, recordings from the MIT BIH uh, arrhythmia database. And uh, when you see multiple loops, then you can already tell that there are um, heart actions of different shapes. And also in the middle, there's a lot of uncertainty and probably fibrillation going on in the um, atria. And on the right hand side, there are multiple forms of uh, ECG actions, but which are sometimes, uh, but, but the, only the one in the middle going downwards is uh, probably the prominent one, and the other two are more rare. Um, yeah, it's a nice way of visualizing those. Another way is you can use data shader. Um, to to visualize 1D, um, only one lead. And the way you do it is you first have to detect or know where these, um, where the big spike is, which is the R spike of the QRS complex. And I'm go not going to go too much into it. Um, that may be for a later talk, how to analyze this more, but uh, this is um, just, uh, basically, you need to know where the R spike is, and then you lay, um, you put all the hard actions over each other and compute a histogram with, for example, data shader, and then you get this picture. And what's remarkable is that this electrical action is not very random, but relatively deterministic. And um, it's often so that um, when you have uh, disease conditions, then it would show up as more random. Uh, we would see more chaos in there or more other thicker lines. But when the lines are relatively um, thin, then you know that this is a very predictable uh, process. And um, now I promised you some machine learning also. And my main project in machine learning with ECG currently is uh, trying to detect beats. Um, normally, there are a lot of uh, beat detection algorithms, most of them relatively simple, some more complicated. And 
you might think you could just look for the big spike and be done. But unfortunately, not all of not all ECG signals are this nice. And so you have to calibrate stuff and tune hyperparameters and so on. And uh, I tried to use, um, or I'm trying to use the convolutional neural network uh, with Keras and uh, to make a more robust beach detector that works with almost anything. And in this picture, I have a blue line, which is the original ECG data. And the blue dots are the manually uh, manually marked um, beach markings, uh, manually edited from the database. And uh, the, the, the orange line is the output of um, the neural network which says with what confidence there is a um, heartbeat. And this works relatively nicely. This um, is a slightly more difficult uh, ECG diagram to analyze, analyze for a computer because there is this, uh, in the middle there is a jump in the voltage level and a less sophisticated algorithm might just say there is another beat because we are having a spike. Uh, but at least this algorithm doesn't do that. And it can go even crazier uh, like this. We have multi-form um, heart actions. The shapes are different from different heart actions, from one heart action to another and on the right side we have probably motion artifacts and smaller QRS heartbeat looking things. And the algorithm still picks that up and um, is congruent with the, um, with, with, uh, the manual uh, demarcation. And then I also tried it across uh, species and this is a, the above diagram is about um, dogs and um, the, the one below is for the mouse. And they are also from PhysioNet. They have a zoo database with a few species. As we see, the algorithm still detects the beats and, um, but it's not that difficult of a task because all the hearts of the mammalian uh, genus, uh, all of the hearts of the mammalian, mammalian um, species will basically produce the same ECG, just a different of, a difference of size. If you have a mouse, that, then a little, a little animal like a mouse will mostly um, have a higher heart rate and this, um, these heart action shapes will be smaller. And by just scaling the signal a little, the um, neural network uh, detects everything just fine. Now, um, if I ever give another talk like this again, for example, Heartbeats for Hackers 2, what might be coming next is, for example, a more reliable hardware because um, hardware is um, hard, uh, hardware is hard and biology is even harder. Um, I intend to use the OLED screen similarly or simultaneously to the measurements. The problem is uh, currently that they both want to be on an I2C bus and I still have trouble figuring that out. I might have a way to make this work, but uh, well, yeah, I, I'd also like to try out mechanical and optical sensors, which would be at, which would add another dimension to the data, um, and it should also be relatively easy. Uh, it would also be nice to show the CNN beat detection in real time, which is possible because it's quite fast, and the neural network isn't that complicated. And I probably would also tell more about ECG analysis. 
Now that was all for now, and I'd like to thank you for listening and the session chair for introducing me. And yeah, well, then we may have time for a few questions. Yeah, so that's great. That's really good. And it's very interesting as well. So we do have one question. So let me put that on screen. So have you played around with the CADIO uh, bandage? Actually, I know nothing about that, but <laughs> from the CC camp uh, 2019, by any chance, there was some interesting ECG experiment with that one as well. Have you heard about that or? No. No. <laughs> yeah. I'd, so I'd, I'd, I'd probably look into it, but. Uh... No. Yeah, uh, but yeah, like all, all I know about ECG because like I know that I, I well I'm an Apple fan, so I use the uh, Apple Watch, and then um, so the, there's this the ECG function that you can measure your heartbeat and stuff, right? So that's the only thing I know. Do you think is is accurate? And if I measure it, can I use my data to do some analysis? <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, I don't know if you can how you can access it, but I think you can just um, access the data. It might e even be the same ship like um, I showed you on this breakout board, or something similar. And um, I mean, you there's all this, there's all, all this regulation about uh, what an ECG should be or, but, but really, I mean, as long as you have um, valid ECG data or you see the shapes, are coming out, then it should be usable for some kind of information, even clinical information in some part, but you would have to be careful with that always. Yeah, so uh, I think Apple also put a disclaimer that like, uh, you know, don't rely on it 100% because, you know, they don't want to uh, be have responsibility if, uh, you know, yeah. if you have problems and then later, you know, sue them or something. So uh, there's another question. Uh, if I got it right, you used a C++ on the ESP32, then like, would this have been possible with Python uh, in terms of performance? I, I haven't tried, um, but I haven't, I, I haven't tried. I don't think it is that possible. I'm not sure because the basic thing is I want to have 1000 samples a second and uh, do some networking in between with the other core and that's, but it's important to get one sample every millisecond at the right at the right or consistent interval, and that's harder when you do garbage collection and whatever else the Python interpreter does. So I haven't tried. At a lower resolution, uh, you might be fine. And it's usually most tutorials and uh, YouTube videos about ESP32 and um, measuring stuff uh, IoT-wise. Uh, use much lower sample frequencies. And so I had to more or less find, figure out myself how to actually do this in do this in a real time way. Yeah, I think it's amazing that like you can do so much stuff uh, with open source tools and Python. But do you think it's a risk if like people can just do like, uh, you know, analyze their own medical data that, you know, with a, with a small gadget like the Apple Watch or anything, then you can collect medical data f f from yourself or from, from your family, then uh, people can analyze it themselves. And do you think it's a danger that, you know, people rely on it too much and didn't get them, um, you know, professional help or things like that? What What's your thought about that? <laughs> it's extremely difficult right now to do that and uh, at all. And I mean, the apps, will have their limitations always, but uh, there's, uh, well, I'd say the applications will always tell you stuff or information about uh, the ECG maybe, and they won't do the diagnosis um, for you. Uh, and you would have to put the diagnose, uh, diagnosis into a context of your other health parameters and then do something about it. So for basic basic pre-screening, it would maybe enough um, with artificial intelligence and so on, because you don't 
expect a very high, a very high rate of disease in pre-screening or screening people and uh, I, don't, I don't see a lot of danger in you really to do ECG analysis you have to know a lot and then you sort of know what you know and what you don't know and well of course you can't use anything what I told here for um, personal medical advice or something but I think that's pretty clear that uh, this doesn't uh, replace any doctors yeah that's uh, absolutely true so um i think yeah of course if you know people if you have uh, you know suspect that you have health problem please get uh, you know professional help i mean like uh, you you could get some you know have some fun project like this uh, you know but you know don't rely on the small gadgets because uh, you know i think all of them will tell you that uh, don't rely on them um so, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Andreas. And this is really, really interesting, I think. And uh, the, the, all, the, all the pictures and demos are great. So um, I think now we are going to a coffee break. Yeah.